Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it, written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing forth this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. Today we're going to begin a series that is going to take some time discussing the judgment that is coming to the church. The judgment will come to the church first before the tribulation time comes. This is important for you to understand, and we're going to be discussing a lot of important things. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17 says, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Who's the house of God? The church. And if it first, first in time, begin at us, what shall be the end of them that are not obeying the gospel, this refers to, these ones that are not obeying, present tense. He expects everybody to be obeying the gospel and walk in his way, see. That means that judgment's going to come to the church first before it comes to the world. And if the righteous, they're the only ones that are going to be passing the test, if the righteous scarcely, which means with difficulty and not easily, because they must conquer everything that comes against them, which we are well able to do when we do what he says. He says, the righteous with difficulty and not easily, not be saved, but are being saved. Remember that salvation is an ongoing work in your life as you are working out your own salvation with fear and trembling, always obeying. Present tense means the fact that it's ongoing action. Passive voice means that somebody else is doing the action to the subject, which is the righteous. They are being saved, is the way you would translate it correctly. So the righteous are being saved with difficulty and not easily as they're walking in line with the Word and doing what is necessary. So, it tells us where should the ungodly and the sin sinner or the sinful ones appear, it refers to. Uh, judgment is going to come against us, an adjective, by the way. So it's talking about the sinful one. Uh, the judgment comes against the sinful ones and the ungodly ones. The righteous are the ones that come through and pass the test. We're going to talk in Revelation today. As we see in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 is a revelation of the judgment that comes on the church before it comes to the world. Many things we must look at. First of all, in Revelation 1, verse 1, it says the revelation of Jesus, but there's no definite article in the Greek. It simply means a revelation of Jesus Christ, as Young springs forth, that God gave to him, God gave to Jesus, to show to his servants what things that must, this is a word die, which means is necessary, to with quickness and speed come to pass. Shortly is not talking about a period of time in the sense that it was going to happen right then when this was being spoken. The word shortly, there's two Greek words here, in, which in this case would be with. The word underneath it is the word takos, which means with quickness and speed. It must come to pass with quickness and speed. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant. A revelation is the disclosure of truth, a revealing of something that is going to happen. The showing of it is the pointing out or to bring forth revelation to us so we can see and understand the things that he's going to bring forth. When it speaks of must, this is really a legal statement because this is a word that means in strong, necessary as binding, it's a covenant word, and it's a legal statement that it must happen, and it's going to happen, <coughs> as it says, with quickness and speed. And why is it going to happen with quickness and speed? Well, the reason is because there's going to be, when this happens, the time of the tribulation, which will be three and a half years, as we have talked about, this is the time of the Antichrist rule for 1260 days, 42 months, times time and half a time. And also, it is the time of the final dealing with the Jews. So there were 69 weeks until Jesus came on the scene. He ministered to them for three and a half years, so 69 and a half weeks have elapsed. Because three and a half years is a half a week. 
of the 70 weeks of God's dealing with the Jews. So there's a half week left, three and a half years, which parallels the time of the tribulation when they will hear the gospel and this time they're going to get saved, praise God. So this is talking about something that is in the future. Now, there have been people that have made a great mistake and thought that this already came to pass because it says shortly, thinking that was hap happening at that time. This is a future event that is going to happen with quickness and speed, which of course has not happened as you will see. Of course, it's the time of the three and a half years. The Antichrist hasn't come on the scene and the time of the church age is not over, which after that, that's when the final three and a half years of the dealing with the Jews will occur but it will be with quickness and speed. We come to verse two. He speaks about who will bear record of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth. And when this means to, to read, it means to read to be able to know accurately and to gain understanding. He wants you to understand what's written here. And they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep we're to be keeping the things that are written therein. This is talking about all the things that it speaks regarding what we're to be doing. We should be keeping them. And then he says, in speaking to this event that's going to happen in the future, for the time, and this reveals that it is a fixed and definite time that is set after the church age is when all this, the tribulation will come, but actually the events here begin prior to the church age. But this is a fixed, definite time, and he says, is at hand, meaning the fact that these events are going to happen and they're going to occur quickly. They're, when the time comes, these things are going to happen at near, near quickly. They're going to happen one after another after another. Things are really going to move through this period of time. We see in verse 4, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before the throne. This is to the churches. That means the churches are to know about all of this. That means shows the fact that they're certainly going to be around for all this, as you will see. And from Jesus Christ is the faithful witness and the first begotten, or the first born, this means, the first born out of, the word ek, the dead, and this is speaking about those ones who were the dead ones, because this is the word for dead, adjective referring to dead ones, plural, talking about more than just one person, not talking about the state of death, but it's the dead ones. So what this is telling us is the fact that the first begotten out of the dead ones it speaks to what? What Jesus accomplished. He accomplished the redemption and the reconciliation. It was the first born from spiritual death to spiritual life to be able to get a brand new spirit for us. And he is the ruler of the kings of the earth as he is now the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And it speaks because this is talking about also to the church unto him that loved us and washed us. Remember this word washed is the word lua, which means to be bathed. And bathed speaks about the whole person, which is what happened when we got born again. Not talking about washing away our personal sins. This is talking about bathing us. And the word bathed, we can even see if we show you this, if you didn't see this before, Titus 3, verse 5, when he speaks about how the, his mercy, he saved us, how? Through the bathing, this is the same word, just a form of it, lutron, the bathing of the new birth, the regeneration. So the bathing speaks of the new birth, which brought us to the place where we now have a new spirit. We are born from above. We are not a sinner any longer. And now we are in the place where we can see the fact that we come into relationship with him. And how is that? Through his own blood that caused, brought forth the redemption. When it says here from, it's interesting, the word from, there's different words that could be translated as far as the prepositions, but this is a word apo, 
which refers to a separation from something. And it can refer to any kind of a separation from one thing that from another by which the union of fellowship of the two is destroyed. That's exactly what happened. Because you and I got a brand new spirit, and how were we now come to the place of being born again, separated from our sins in the sense of what happened at the new birth? We got a brand new spirit that's right with God. Your spirit doesn't sin. Where does sin dwell? In the flesh and in the soul. Can you still sin in those areas? Yes. But there's been a separation because you got a brand new spirit that doesn't sin. And that's really what it's referring to. It's talking about the new birth that we now have a brand new spirit and we have been separated from that, those sins that have controlled us through the flesh because we have a brand new spirit. We're not a sinner any longer, praise God. So, we come to verse 6, also what he's done for us. He's made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. He's brought us into being kings, royal priesthood, and we're also a holy priesthood. We also have authority to rule and reign and priests before God to come into the very presence of God, unto God and his Father, and to him be glory and dominion. So this speaks of what we have become now. You and I have come to the place of being kings and priests that we now can walk in authority and we can walk in fellowship with him and come into the very presence of God. So these things, verse 4 to 6, speaks about the churches as he's speaking to them and what Jesus has accomplished for us. We come to verse 7 and it now jumps ahead actually in time because it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. Well, when does Jesus come with clouds? It's when he comes back in the, there with the clouds, which are the saints from heaven, when he brings the judgment upon the nations. That's what it's talking about. Because it says, every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, all the kings of the earth shall wail because of him. Why are they going to wail? Because the judgment is coming upon them in the final judgment. You see, when he comes the first time, they don't see him. Remember, he comes... And nobody knows the hour or the day, remember referring to the time of the, uh, the, the fulfillment of the Feast of Trumpets. Nobody knows that exact time, so they're not going to see him then. It's not talking about when he comes in the rapture to catch the church up. This is talking about 10 days later when he comes to bring the judgment that will come on in the, with the clouds. And this speaks of the uh, the fact that he's going to come, and actually it's the clouds, and who are that? That's all the saints that come from heaven. And we know there's many scriptures that speak about how he comes in the clouds. And what's he coming to do? He's coming to take back dominion over the earth and to begin to rule on the earth for the, for the thousand year reign. He says, I am Alpha Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. This was the one who speaks the Almighty God, the God who is all-powerful, manifesting power. And he's going to manifest tremendous power in bringing the judgment that is going to come upon the nations as they are going to see tremendous uh, judgments that will come throughout the three and a half years and then a final judgment that will come at the end. We come to verse 9. Speaking of John, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation, the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that's called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is the time when Domitian was bringing tremendous persecution against the Christians, and John, he was banished to the isle of Patmos. He's about 90-some years old at this point in time, and he was, he's hoping he'd die out, but Domitian actually died out before him, and he didn't die out because he ended up getting out of there and they ended up taking him back to Ephesus before he ended up uh, being finished with his days. But there on this isle, Patmos, where he was there, he got the revelation of this tremendous judgment that is going to come. Verse 10 tells us something important. I was not in the spirit. There is no the. It says here in the Greek, I in, this is the word en, and this is the word spirit. It literally says, I became 
in spirit. He became in spirit because it was a revelation in spirit of the things that were going to happen. And what, when, is, when was this? I became in spirit on the Lord's day. Now, when we talk about the Lord's day, what are we talking about? Many people have thought, well, this must be talking about a Sabbath day. Well, the Lord's day is the seventh day, but that's not what it's talking about. Because six days man had the rule in the earth. The seventh day is the Lord's day of rule and reign. And that is what it's all about. The millennial reign of Jesus Christ. He's talking about the day of the Lord. Lord's day could be said the day of the Lord. He's in spirit on the Lord's day, the day of the Lord, getting the revelation of the day of the Lord when Jesus comes back to take back the authority over the earth. And he heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it into the seven churches. It's to be sent to the churches because they're going to be here. Not only are they going to hear, hear the things that are important because of the judgment that comes on the church first, but also because they need to know what's going to happen afterwards so that they can be preserved and protected and be aware of what is going to happen during the tribulation period. Send it to the seven churches which are in Asia and Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamos and Thyatira and Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. These were seven churches. And these seven churches, seven is the number of completeness. This isn't just written to them because it's written to all the churches at all times. All the churches are to understand what is being written. He turned to see the voice that spake with me, and he turned and saw the seven golden candlesticks. In midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about with a paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool. White speaks of righteousness. As white as snow, and his eyes were of a flame of fire. And a fire speaks of judgment, because he's coming as the righteous judge to bring the judgment, the righteous judgment uh, to all. And it starts with the church. His feet like unto the fine brass, as they were burned in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters. And he had in his hand, right hand, right hand speaks of authority, his right hand, seven stars. Now out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. The two-edged sword divides that which is righteous from that which is unrighteous, that which is of him from that which is not of him. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Uh, we should never have fear. He is the one who we trust in, look to him. He's coming, he's the first and he's the last. He's coming to bring forth what needs to happen, to bring forth the judgment upon the nations and take back the authority and rule and reign through the millennial reign. <coughs> I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Well, that means he has conquered death. He has conquered the works of the enemy. Of course, he conquered Satan because he says he has the keys of hell and of death. That means he has accomplished this redemption and this conquering of the enemy so that he can come and take back the earth. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, that he's going to, with authority he's going to release, and the seven golden sticks, candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. He sends forth those angels that go forth that carry out his works. And there are angels over the churches, and these angels also are ones who are going to be bringing forth judgments, as you will see. And the seven candlesticks which thou saw are the seven churches. Candlesticks have light. These are churches that have had light. And whether they keep having light depends on whether they pass the test or not. And then he begins here in chapter 2. And first of all, before we go through this, we want to mention some important things. First of all, we realize this must happen. It's a legal statement. It's going to happen with quickness and speed. It's going to be the manifestation of the Almighty power. He's going to have manifest tremendous power during this particular time. 
and it is going is to all the end time churches who are going to be here and he's going to release his authority now the revelation is about judgment and one of the things we need to look at is first of all proof that the church is being judged here the church is being judged first we saw that in first peter chapter 4 verse 17 proof that the judge is the church is being judged and it's written here is just in many verses. You'll see it as we go through, but we're just going to jump ahead and look at some of them. He says, Nevertheless, I have, not somewhat, somewhat, somewhat is a italicized word. It's not there. It just kind of watered down the statement. It literally says, I, nevertheless, I am having against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Well, he's going to bring judgment against him because of that. And what does he say? He's going to remove his candlestick out of his place if he, except he repents. Now that's judgment, isn't it? Here's another case we see. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Oh, well, that's judgment as well. In verse 20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Talking about this church, the Thyatira. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, who calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. I gave her space to repent of her fornication. She repented not. I will cast her into a bed, and then commit adultery into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Well, that's judgment, isn't it? That also tells you something. The judgment of the church happens right before the Great Tribulation. It also tells you, because it hasn't happened yet, it also tells you the church will be in the Great Tribulation because this church is going to be cast into the Great Tribulation. Anybody that tries to tell you that the church is going to be out of here before in a pre-tribulation rapture is deceived and is a false, teaching false, and we're going to prove that to you beyond a shadow of a doubt as we go through all this. But you can see it right here. This destroys it right there because this is a church that's going to be cast into great tribulation. Now they, obviously, they're not gone, are they? Except they repent of their deeds. Chapter 3, verse 2. This is judgment that's coming. Here he says, I've not found thy works, not perfect, but filled up before God. And what's going to happen to these guys? He talks about if they, the things if they don't, the things they receive, heard, and hold fast, and repent, and if they won't watch, he says, I'm going to come on thee as a thief, and you won't know what hour I'll come on thee. That's a judgment statement as well. And what happens to the guys that don't overcome? The guys that overcome are come clothed with white raiment, but what about the guys that don't? I will not blot out his name out of the book of life for the ones that overcome, but the ones who are not walking right, that are defiled, are going to get their names blotted out. That is judgment. Verse 16, talking about Laodicea, because you're lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee, vomit you out of my mouth. Those are all statements of judgment that are going to happen. And also the fact that it is, again, before the Great Tribulation, very clear. Them that commit adultery with their into, what's he going to do? Cast her into great tribulation. The great megas, tribulation, ellipsis, the very same words that are used in Matthew chapter 24, verse 21, where it says, Then there shall be great megas, ellipsis, tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor no, nor ever shall be. Some generation has to be around when this happens, and we are that generation. It's quite a sobering thought, but it has to come, and it's coming now. God wants us to understand also that, as we've talked about, the glorious church is going to rise. It's going to see the glory of God poured out mightily upon it at the end time church, more glory, glorious than the early church. We talked about out of that Habagehi. And we know that this is happening at the very end because the feasts of the Lord show not only the work of Jesus, but also the revelation of the work of God in the church. And tabernacles being the last one, it's the end time completed work in the church right before the tribulation starts 
and where, where Jesus is going to be coming back, of course. It speaks of the time of tabernacles. Well, tabernacles is the 15th day of the seventh month, and it goes for seven days. And then there's an eighth day, which is the last great day of the feast. And that is referred to when he's in John 7, 37. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. This is the glorious church full of the rivers of living water that are going to be poured out. And we've talked about this out of Psalms 46 and out of Ezekiel 37, how the, the rivers are going to rise and it's going to fill the whole people that are there in the temple referring to the church and that they're, whatever, the rivers are going to flow out of them and wherever it goes it's going to bring forth the fishes to be saved, they're going to be harvested, they're going to be, healing's going to come, tremendous things are going to happen. The rivers are going to flow out of the end time church and it's at a time of tabernacles fulfillment. It is going to happen. That's what this is all speaking of. So the judgment on the church happens at, right at the end, the end of the church age. The church age began in 30 A.D. It ends in 2030 A.D. It's, we're almost to 2022, only eight years away. It's going to be happening. Also, remember that prior to when these things happen, as we saw in Revelation chapter 2, in verse 2, remember he said, don't be soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit or by word, nor by letter as from us that the day of Christ is at hand. No. Let no man deceive you by any means, warning us so we don't get deceived. For that day shall not come except there come an apostasy. A falling away isn't just some people that suddenly just kind of got a little bit not walking in the way of the Lord like they should. No, they leave the Lord. They abandon Him. This is apostasy. This is a defection and a leaving of him. It's going to happen first. In fact, there have been some that are even beginning to do that. There have been some pastors recently of churches that said, I don't believe in the Lord anymore. It's astounding, but it's beginning to happen already. And it will happen down the road. And what else is going to happen? And the man of sin be revealed. This is all before the Lord is going to come back. Well, that's the man of sin. That's the lawless one, the Antichrist, who is going to come on the scene. Well, we go back to Revelation 2, and we see what's happening in the end-time church. It speaks here in chapter 2, verse 1, first Ephesus. It says, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, and walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. What are the seven golden candlesticks? The churches. He's walking in the churches. What is he going to do in the end time? He's going to walk in the churches to find out whether they're going to walk in his ways or not. Remember, he's coming into the temple, as we saw in John 7 in Tabernacles, and he's going to teach the truth, and he's going to find out who's going to walk in his ways and who's not going to walk in his ways. We've even seen this before, pointing out what it's really pointing towards in Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 14, where it says, For the Lord walketh, just like He's walking in the church, in the midst of thy camp, the camp being a type of the church, to deliver thee. He wants us to get delivered of sin, delivered of everything, delivered of all the evil spirits, delivered of everything that's not of God, and to give up thine enemies before thee so you can cast them all out and get set free. Therefore shall thy camp, a type of the church, be holy. They must be holy. Only the holy ones are going to be accepted by him because the righteous ones, the fruits of righteousness, produces holiness. That he see no unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. Meaning if he sees those who aren't holy, he's going to turn away from them. We need to see that we're holy. And what will determine that? When it says unclean thing, it actually means one who is naked. If we're spiritually naked because we don't have not put on the spiritual clothes of God, clothed ourselves, we're to clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and become like Him, as we've talked about. If we aren't clothed, 
He's going to turn away from us. Who's going to do this work in you? God is, through the Word. He's going to accomplish all this work to deliver you, to set you free, to clothe you, to bring you to the place of having the Lord Jesus Christ on. But we go back to Revelation. And as we see him walking in the church, he's examining it to find out who's walking in his ways and who is not. And what's the first thing he says to every single one of these churches? I know thy works. Now, this is not a good translation. All the translations translated no, except Young's, who has translated have known. Most all. There may be some that have translated have known, but most all of them translated just no. Why have they done that? Is it right? It's wrong. It's the word I do. And it happens to be in the perfect tense. The perfect tense means action completed in the past with present results of the time of speaking. And it especially speaks of something that started at one point and continued on, and here it is, this, I see what it is at this point in time, at the time of speaking. That's why it should be translated, I have known your works, all of them, all along, and I see what they are. Not just know, because this more having known <clears throat> describes the fact that he knows all of our works. All of our works, because we're going to be judged for what? All of our works. So this is what it's talking about to each case. Your works are important because judgment is according to our works. And he speaks of the labor, the patience, how thou cannot bear them that are evil, how hast tried them that say they're apostles and are not, and has found them liars, and is born, and has patience, and for his name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Let's take some time to look at these things. We're going to during this series, because we need to understand what he's talking about. When he talks about the labor, this labor is a word which refers to the intense labor united with trouble and toil, Otherwise, these guys were working, and yet they had a lot of things coming against them, too. As you're going forth to do the works of God and carry out the service of the Lord and laboring for Him, the enemy is not going to sit by idly and not cause any problems or not even try to disrupt anything or, or cause any negatives coming against you. Of course, he will challenge you, and he will press you. He will try to do everything possible to disrupt the things that you are accomplishing for the Lord. So this speaks of intense labor united with trouble and toil, toil, talking about the attacks of the enemy. And when we talk about this, we see that 1 Thessalonians 1.3 speaks about remembering without ceasing your work of faith and your labor, same word, of love. It's a labor of love. Everything that we do in reaching out to people, it's going to be motivated by love. We're commanded to walk in love seeing everybody as valuable and precious, and reaching out to minister. You must walk in love towards everybody. If you're not walking in love towards everybody, there's something wrong, because you are commanded to walk in love at all times in your life. And this labor that we have, God takes notice of it. Because remember, we're going to be judged according to our works. It's determining whether or not we're going to pass the test or not, be approved or not. Hebrews 6.10 God is not unrighteous to forget your work and your labor. Again, this intense labor that you are bringing forth of love, which you have showed toward His name in that you have ministered to the saints. Notice, you show it towards His name in following after Him and serving Him when you've ministered to the saints. You've been a servant. Remember, He says, the greatest is the servant of all. God wants you to be a servant. You can't be a selfish Christian. You can't be a bless me, forget about everybody else kind of attitude. No. The greatest is a servant of all. He wants you to be a servant, to reach out and minister to others. And he's talking about not that you have ministered all these things that you've done in the past. As aorist tense would just refer to a simple past tense. But it's also talking about this is an ongoing work that's been happening with these guys. Because when it says, do minister here, this is talking about present tense now, meaning continuous, ongoing action now. So he's talking about in that you have 
ministered to all these saints in the past, and you are ministering to them. Oh, that shows that this is your lifestyle, this is your track record, and that's what he expects of us. You can't just say, well, I served you a little bit sometime, but I'm not doing anything now. No, you're not, you're not going to pass the test. You are to be serving in the past, and you should be serving now, serving the Lord and carrying out the things that he wants. We also see over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, when we talk about this labor. Verse 5, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and that our labor be in vain. Ah, these guys were reaching out to win people to the Lord, establish churches. And here he wanted to know, did the tempter get to you and take you, or get, get you to, to back away from the things that have been sown in him? Now the devil will try to work to try to get people to turn away from the way of the Lord. That's why you want to not only help them get born again, but we're supposed to make disciples of all nations. You should be ministering to them and help them to get the word in them and so encourage them to walk in the ways of the Lord and get, become disciples. And so that the labor, whatever labor, might not be in vain, the fact that it wouldn't be fruitful. Instead, the enemy would come and steal the word out of the people and cause them to back off. So it's important that you do whatever's necessary, if, whatever you can do, to minister to people. Don't just minister one thing and then just forget about it. From then on, if you have opportunity to continue to minister to them, do it continually. In fact, this labor, it's supposed to be, as we already saw, your lifestyle. And we see in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, he speaks and says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, firm, immovable, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We're also to be abounding in it. You are to do the work of the Lord. God is raising you up to carry out the ministry that He has, and every one of us are to be a workman for Him. The work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Everything you do, whether it's sowing seed, whether it's talking to someone, encouraging them, leading them to be born again, sharing truth with them, bringing correction to them, confronting them on things, whatever it might be, as long as you're bringing the Word to them and doing the work of the Lord with the right attitude of love, then your labor's not in vain. God will not forget that. And this is what they're being, one of the things they're going to be judged for. What's your labor been? Have you been ministering for the Lord? Are you a servant? Are you carrying out the things that He wants you to do? In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8, he that planteth and he that watereth are one. You might be planting, you might be watering, whatever. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Whatever your part is, you're going to get rewarded for. God wants you to understand that rewards will come because of your service to the Lord. You need to be a servant and be reaching out. In fact, at the end of your days, we even see it in Revelation chapter 14, speaking of these that had gone on to heaven. They died. It says, I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. God pays attention to all your works. So, one of the things that we see that he's looking at is your works. That of labor for the Lord, of serving Him and carrying out the things that he's told you to do, which is what you and I must do. And then he talks about patience. The word patience is the word hupomone, which means steadfastness and constancy, as well as endurance. You need to get co constant and steadfast. And when we talk about this steadfastness, where is this working at? It's working in the area of the soul. Luke chapter 21, verse 19 says, In your patience or your steadfastness possess ye your souls. Remember, we're made of three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit gets changed. You get a brand new spirit. You're born again. Your body, of course, is not. Your soul is made up of your will, your intellect, and emotions, the way you choose, the way you think and reason, and your emotions that affect you in causing you, in what, how you think, how you choose, the way you carry out your life. Well, in your steadfastness, 
on the Word, you will possess control in the area of the soul so you don't let the devil get to you because where's the battleground? It's in the soulless realm. He will work at you through in the mind, the thoughts, through emotions, through trying to get your will, you know. I don't want to give you, give you attitudes to try to war against your will from choosing the way of the Lord. And it's also important that you have steadfastness to maintain confident expectancy in what God will do for you. 1 Thessalonians 1.3 Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and your patience, steadfastness of hope, which is a confident expectancy of whatever it is that He has for you, including eternal salvation. You get hope from the Word of God and you should have a confident expectancy of what He will do in any situation to perform His Word. But it's going to take steadfastness in the area of the soul. Steadfastness is also important to bring forth fruit. Because remember, when you hear the Word, what does the devil do? He's coming to try to take the Word out of your heart. Remember, the seed's the Word, and the devil comes to try to take the Word out of your heart lest you believe and be saved. He wants to get rid of it because he knows that's the power of God. That's going to produce the, the promises of in your, in your life. It's going to bring forth the things that he purposes for you. Well, in order to bring forth the fruit on the good ground, on the good ground are they which in an honest and a good heart have heard the word, they're keeping, holding it, retaining it, and bringing forth fruit with steadfastness. Meaning that if you're not going to be steadfast, you won't bring forth fruit. You must be steadfast in the soul to bring forth fruit. And God's looking at your fruitfulness, remember. How does He know whether you're a real disciple or not? But whether you have much fruit. He's looking at you and He's going to certainly be judging us based on whether we have fruit in our life and are walking in the way of the Lord. Remember, He says, you know them by their fruits. Well, you're going to have to have steadfast in the soul if you're going to bring forth fruit. And of course, we also see as Colossians mentions in chapter 1, verse 9, about how he wants us to be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We get precise, correct knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. It comes from the Word. For what? That you and I might walk worthy of the Lord into all pleasing. We walk worthy, we're going to be doers of the Word. Being fruitful in every good work, well, that's because also we've been steadfast in the things of God. And increase in the knowledge of God, strengthen with all might according to His glorious power into all steadfastness, patience, the word hupomone, steadfastness. We need to be steadfast and long-suffering with joyfulness. If you're going to see the fruitfulness, if you're going to see you be walking worthy of the Lord, if you're going to see yourself come to the place of being strengthened with all might and have the power of God manifest, because the power of God's in the Word. And if you're not steadfast in the Word and He takes it out, uh, are you going to be walking worthy before the Lord? No. It's also of a necessity, as we see in 2 Peter in verse 6, when it talks about the things that you add to your faith, virtue, moral excellence, knowledge, temperance, that's controlling the flesh, and patience, steadfastness, controlling the soulless realm. These things are of a necessity because when they're in you and abounding, as it says, uh, these things are in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the precise, correct knowledge of our Lord Jesus. Otherwise, you'll bring much fruit because of these things abounding in your life. And further, you're to give diligence to make your calling and election sure, because if you do these things, including being steadfast in the soul, then you might never fall. You might never fall or stumble. And that's important because those are the ones who have an entrance ministered abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We talked about all these things before. These things must happen in our life. We must be steadfast. You're also going to have to be steadfast when the persecutions and the pressure comes. It will come. 2 Thessalonians 1.4 So we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your steadfastness, patience, and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you have been enduring, having to stand against and hold up in the tax that come. 
and persecutions and tribulations come, steadfastness of soul is essential so you don't crumble, so you don't give up, so you don't throw in the towel, so you don't back off the word or compromise in some way. Romans chapter 5 tells us something that's important. Not only so, but we glory in tribulations or pressures. Why? Because we understand that pressure is going to come to find out whether or not you're going to walk in the way of the Lord or not. It's going to happen. Everybody will have pressure coming against you. It's one of the things the devil comes at you to try to take the word out of your heart. Knowing that pressure brings into operation or brings about, worketh, or really it brings about steadfastness. It's going to find out. Are you steadfast or not? The pressure comes. Are you going to be steadfast or are you going to back off and run and give up and throw in the towel and let the word be taken out? So when pressure comes, whenever you have pressure coming against you, they're going to find out whether you really have are steadfast on the word or not. And steadfastness, it says here in the King James it produces experience. It's really not a good word because it's a word which means approving to be approved, to show the proof of you and that whether you're genuine or not. Otherwise, steadfastness shows if you're the real deal, if you're really set on the Word of God. It's approving of you. It will show forth whether you are going to crumble or you're going to stand firm on the Word. And what's that produce, of course? When you have that, then you're going to have hope, confident expectancy of what God will do to bring the promises to pass. Now again, chapter 15, that is, verse 4 says, Whatsoever things were written aforetime are written for our learning that we through steadfastness, the word patience, and comfort or encouragement, this can also mean of the scriptures, might have, be having hope. How am I going to have hope? It's going to be through the scriptures. But it's going to be through the steadfastness in me and through the encouragement that the scriptures will give me because I'm keeping it before my mind. I'm keeping it in my heart. I'm making sure that this is the word that I'm thinking upon. And I'm not about to back off of it because we see that in Hebrews. It really drives this home in verse 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. You can never cast away your confidence in God or in the word or in his promise or what he says he'll do is great recompense of reward. But what do you need? You have need of steadfastness. You've got to be steadfast because the attacks will come. That after you've done the will of God, you might receive or commitzo, carry off the promise. That means steadfastness is of necessity for you to get the promise. And one of the promises, remember, is eternal life. You've got to be steadfast that you never crumble against any kind of attacks that come against you. Steadfastness is what you operate in in order to see any promise come to pass. Because faith works with steadfastness as well as long-suffering in the situation to bring the promises. Look what it says. If we hope for that that we see not, we have confident expectancy for that, that we don't see it in the natural, it's in the realm of the spirit. Then how do we handle this? We do this with patience, with steadfastness. We are ex waiting patiently, expectantly, this refers to for it. This is the way you function. You always have hope, confident expectancy because of the scripture. And we haven't seen this manifest yet. But with steadfastness, we are expectantly waiting for it, knowing it's going to come to pass in our life. And therefore, what do you and I have to have? One of the things that you and I are to run after in our life is steadfastness. You've got to have it, and you're going to be tested, and you're going to be tried, and you're, you're, the judgment will come. Are you steadfast or not? It's a necessity. If not, you won't get the promises, you won't have fruit, you won't overcome, you'll crumble under the attacks. He says in chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, verse 11, Thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after. This is the word dioko, which means to run after. Run after these things. Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, meekness. That's one of the things that we're to run after. We're to run after these things, to have them in our life. You've got to have them. In fact, 
We see it again in Hebrews chapter 12. Wherefore, seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, we lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us, and we run with steadfastness, the word again, the race or the contest for the prize, which is the prize of the victor having overcome the enemy. It's set before us, looking, turning your eyes away from every other thing, everything else and fixing them on something, fixing them on Jesus, on the word, the author and finisher of your faith, who, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so it says, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, that he, this is the hupomene, which means steadfastness, it to remain, to be steadfast, against himself, lest you get wearied and faint in your minds. Or actually in the soulish realm, this refers to. The battleground is in the realm of the soul. We see the same thing. And here it even points out that if you aren't steadfast, you'll never get to perfection. You've got to be, get to the place of that because we're to become, go on to perfection, remember. James 1, 2, my brother, count it all joy when you are enveloped and compassed about with all these diverse temptations. You're not going to let them move you. You're going to keep your eyes on the Lord Remember, the devil tries to get your joy away from you. Don't let it happen. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith, which is what it's happened, it's attacking your faith. What's it do? It brings into operation, remember, brings about steadfastness. And you've got to stay steadfast regardless of what happens. Let steadfastness have her perfect work. Steadfast is to be having its perfect work. This is a command, continually to be having its perfecting work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Otherwise, if you're not steadfast, you'll never get to perfection, you'll never get to be complete, and you're and the lacking nothing. That's why we gotta be steadfast. And that's why he brings it out. I know you're steadfast as because you're going to be judged according to whether you've been steadfast or not upon the Word of God. He's looking to see whether you're following that way or not. It even refers to the steadfastness of Job. And if you heard us talk about Job, remember that Job is where that when we saw what the Hebrew actually says, how Satan had set his heart against Job to try to bring destruction against him, and how he was trying to do everything possible to get him to deny and turn away and curse God and give up on him. His wife even got in league with the devil on that one, but he never did. He was steadfast. He said, you've heard of the steadfastness of Job. He was steadfast and he never gave up. He saw the end of the Lord. The Lord's very pitiful and great, a tender mercy. And of course, he got delivered out of things and he got twice as much in return. Then we come to Revelation and we see this is important about the steadfastness. You've got to be operating in the spirit, not in the natural. Look what it says. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience, the steadfastness, and the faith of the saints. Are we going to operate in the natural? No. We're going to operate in the spirit because God will protect us. We have authority in the time of the tribulation. It doesn't stop. You have authority over all the power of the enemy, even though he seeks to run and destroy the Christians and kill them. But obviously there's ones that have come through because the ones that are holy, without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, they're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. You're going to have to be steadfast and your faith so that you don't give place to anything that would try to get you to go bow down to the natural. Now remember that Jesus said, buy a sword. What was that for? It's for self-defense. Am I going to get on the attack and go after? No, that's going to be a mistake. But for self-defense? Yeah. So the guy that's going to go after and be with a, get in and think in the natural he's going to take the, all these bad guys out. <laughs> no. You're going to operate in the spirit. You must engage in spiritual warfare 
That's what will enable you to be protected so you don't go into captivity and so that you will be protected and you'll conquer the enemy so you won't get taken down and killed. That's the steadfastness and the faith of the saints. We come to chapter 14, verse 12. Remember, it's what you do in the spirit that counts. Here is the steadfastness of the saints, the saints of the holy ones. Here are they that are keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Are we going to stop keeping the commandments of God or in faith during all those things that happen? No. We keep the commandments of God, we keep doing the Word, and we keep operating in faith at all times. Faith is the victory that will conquer the world and deliver you and keep you and protect you and give you uh, victory over all of the works of the enemy. And your steadfast in your faith shows your steadfastness in relying on Him to deliver you, to protect you, and to conquer all enemies that would be arrayed against you. Romans chapter 2. Steadfastness. Look what it begins in verse 5. It says, these are the guys that don't pass the test. After their hardness and impenitent heart, unrepented heart, treasure up to them thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment. See, this is the righteous judgment of God. He's not an unrighteous God. He's a righteous God. He is going to judge in righteousness. He's going to render to every man according to their deeds, according to their works. It's going to happen for everyone. But to them who by patient continuance, they translate it this way, but it's the same word, hopomone, steadfastness, through steadfastness in good work, not well-doing. It really means, this is the word good, agathos, and this is the word, word ergon, which means work, translated work nearly most all the times, or deed. So, through good, your steadfastness in good work, you're always doing what God wants, you're seeking for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. And that's what we want, of course. But the ones that are contentious, those ones are out of themselves, essentially, because this is talking about two words out of a desire to put oneself forward. Anybody that's putting yourself forward, you're doing what you want. You're calling the shots. You haven't denied yourself. You haven't lived unto him. You're doing what you want to do. You're in trouble. And do not obey the truth. Because you and I are to be obedient to the truth, the word. Jesus did nothing of himself, remember. But obey unrighteousness, which means you're, if you're not obeying the truth, you must be obeying something else, which is unrighteousness. Anything that's not of the truth will be unrighteousness. What are you going to get? Indignation and wrath and tribulation, pressure and anguish. Can God deliver us out of all the pressure that's coming? Sure. It'll be there, but we can be delivered out of it all. And anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. <laughs> They're in trouble. But glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good. we got to be doing good, the things that God tells us to do, if we're going to be delivered. We'll go back to Revelation. So here we see, that's another important point for you. Your steadfastness. You and I are going to be judged for it. He's looking at, are you steadfast on the things of God? That's tied into your promises, tied into you maintaining hope, tied into you seeing you're going to have victory and, and, and come to perfection as well, as we saw. And then he goes on and says, And how thou canst not bear them which are evil? Well, when it talks about not being able to bear them that are evil, you can't tolerate them that are evil, or you can't put up with them that are evil, this particular word means. And we shouldn't put up with those that are evil. We shouldn't tolerate those that are evil, especially here he's talking in the church, remember, those that weren't doing right. What happens with those ones, remember, that aren't doing right? They've got to be dealt with. Remember this guy who was having his wife, his father's wife, in sexual sin, incest? Well, they wouldn't do anything about it. 
They wouldn't take him away. Well, Paul comes and said, he's going to deal with it. He's going to come, and with his power, spirit and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's going to deliver one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. The spirit may be saved if he comes to repentance in the day of the Lord Jesus, <coughs> and the judgment comes. In other words, you can't have this kind of thing going on. He said, your glory is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. A little leaven, that's a type of sin, will contaminate the whole deal. You cannot have those kind of things. That's why it says, you can't, these guys did the right thing. You can't stand, you can't tolerate, or you weren't going to put up with any of this evil stuff going on. That's right. That's the attitude that we should have. What are we to do? Purge it out. Cleanse it out. Get rid of it. It's got to go. That's why he goes on and he says that we, we keep the feast with sincerity and truth in, in the realm of the Spirit by getting rid of the unleavened bread is getting rid of all the sin. Get rid of it all, including the church. It's got to go. He said, I wrote an epistle not to company with fornicators. They were letting fornicators in their church. You cannot have that. Not only are the fornicators, but with the covetous, the extortioners, the idolaters. Oh. He says, if any brother is a fornicator, a uh, covetous, idolater, railer, drunkard, extortioner, you don't even eat with them. We cannot compromise anything. So these guys were not, they were not putting up with anything. And that was right. That's the attitude that we must have. We're not going to put up and we're not going to compromise, that means. People that compromise are going to be in trouble. You compromise, you'll pay the price. These guys, you cannot put, put up with, let's tolerate these guys. Now, we're not going to tolerate them that are evil. He tried those, they tried those that said they were apostles and are not and found them liars. Oh, they said they were something and they weren't. You've got to stand up for what is right. And then it goes on and says, and that's born. This is referring to the fact that you got rid of them. You carried them away. Not that you bear with them and you tolerated them, because the verse before says you weren't going to tolerate them. This is talking about in the context, and when you look up the word, especially in Freiburg's, he points out the fact that this is talking about getting rid of them, carrying them away, removing them, he even points out. Removing. And you have to look in the context of what it is. Otherwise, it'd be contradictory. You don't say, I'm not going to put up with you, and the next thing I am going to put up with you. This is talking about removing them. And you've had steadfastness, for my name's sake, as, not, as labored and not fainted. You see, God is against those who are doing evil. It doesn't matter whether you're born again or not. 1 Peter 3.12 The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. And his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that are doing evil. Anybody. Christians could be doing evil. The face of the Lord's against them. He's a righteous God, a holy God, and he's only going to be for those who are going to walk in his ways. He's against those that are doing evil. So it means you and I must stand, take a stand against anything that's evil, anything that's wrong, anything that's sinful in the world or in the church, wherever. Stand up and take a stand against any ungodliness or unrighteousness. That means what? No compromise. This, these guys were passing the test on this. Well, that was good. They weren't compromising. They were going to do what was right. And they're going to test these ones that say there's something. Just want to make their own ministry and declare something, you know. They want a title on all these kind of people. <laughs> well, we don't have any of that stuff. It's not of God. If you compromise, you're going to lose. What you ever compromise to keep, you always lose. And that means you can't compromise in your family. You've got to take a stand for what's right. You've got to take a standard of righteousness. We're doing this. Remember, Eli compromised. He didn't restrain his children from doing evil. It cost him and his children. They all died. We've got to take a stand for what's right. You're setting the Word of God as first place in your life and in everything that you do. There is going to be no compromise. These guys would not compromise. And then he says another thing about them, a good thing. He says, you have not fainted. And that's good. 
God wants us to make sure that we don't faint. And you know, and also these guys, I mean, they were testing these guys. They tried them, they were testing them. You gotta test things. How are you gonna test things? You're gonna test it through the word, aren't you? Remember what it says in the, about in the last days? In Matthew 24, verse 11, many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Oh, these ones, they needed to test these guys and find out if they're right or not. And we saw the same thing in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. He talks about there are false prophets among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. The false has to be exposed. It has to be dealt with. That's why we've got to stand up and check everything out in line with the Word. How do you, how do you find out if something's right or not? You've got to know the Word yourself, and you've got to look things up and find out if it's in line with the Word. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the Word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily whether the things were so. If something's not in line with the Word of God, then there's a problem. If it's not confirmed in the Word, it's false. I don't care who it is. I don't care what their notoriety is. I don't care what they say, what you, what you might think about them, what you don't think about them. It's false. If I'm bringing something that's false, there's something wrong with me. If someone else is bringing something wrong and it's false, there's something wrong with them. It's false. We must not compromise for anybody. That is important. And remember, what happens to these ones if they just kind of follow someone that they don't check out and, and find out whether it's true or not, and they make a mistake? <laughs> Look at what it says. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they both fall in the ditch. We can never say, well, so-and-so told me such and such. So-and-so was leading me on this, and I was following this. you got to be sure it's right yourself. You got to be in the Word and know what the Word says. It is absolutely imperative that you and I know the Word of God. We go back to chapter 2, and it talks about then, remember we were at the end of that verse 3, they haven't fainted. We can't be fainting. We can't get weary. You're going to be tested. Are you ever going to faint? Are you going to ever get weary? No, we're not going to ever get weary. We're going to be steadfast on the things of God, and we're not going to work. Because where do you get wearied at? It's in the soulish realm, isn't it? Remember we saw in Hebrews 12, verse 3, Consider him that search as contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you get wearied, and it says faint in your soul, minds. You miss what's being said here. Wearied is the main verb here, and it says that you might get wearied, Subjunctive mood, you're not supposed to, but you could if you meet the wrong, if your conditions are met that you got wearied. Not and faint, because the word faint is not a main verb, it is a participle, meaning the way you would translate it would be being faint. That's why Young's translates it this way. I would instead, I think it'd be better, lest you might be wearied being or be, having been faint in your suke soul. Where's the battleground? It's in the soul. There's no room for you getting wearied. You say, well, if you knew my circumstances, you'd understand. And you're under your circumstances then. You're in trouble. You don't let your circumstances dictate the way you're going to be in life. You do the Word of God, and you let the Word dictate what you're going to do. Amen. Lest you might get wearied, having fainted in your souls. I'm not going to faint. No way. In fact, what's the Bible say? It even makes a covenant statement, a, a, quite a statement, when it says, He spake a parable to this, this end in Luke 18, 1. Men must the word necessary, translated must. 58 of the 106 uses. Necessary and must always pray and not to faint. We're not going to get wearied. We're not going to faint. If you quit praying, 
you must have fainted. Why did you quit praying? Well, it just got too much for me. Well, the devil got to you. You always pray. You pray without ceasing. What's prayer do? It's putting the power of God in operation. It's bringing God on the scene. The angels are hearkening to it. They're working on your behalf. You're putting God in operation. If you quit praying, you just shut them down. We can't be doing that. And are you going to reap the things that you've been sowing if you faint? No. Galatians chapter 6. Look at what it says. Verse 7. Be not deceived. God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. If he's sowing good things, it's good news. He's going to reap good things. But if he's sowing bad things, uh, he's going to be reaping bad things. He's not going to get away with it. He sows to the flesh. Of the flesh he'll reap destruction, corruption. But if he sows to the Spirit, in line with the Word, of the Spirit will reap life everlasting. And that's what we want. But does that mean that I'm automatically going to get it because I sowed to the Spirit once? No. Let us not be weary. Don't get wearied out in doing well. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we don't weaken, throw in the towel, back off, shut down our prayer, quit speaking, quit holding fast our confession, quit putting our faith in operation, quit casting out, whatever it might be, no. Otherwise, you continue on. That's the way life has to be for you. Because you're going to gain total victory when you put God in operation. 2 Thessalonians 3.13 You brethren, but, but ye brethren, be not weary in doing well, that you might not be weary. It's a subjunctive mood. So he's telling us, you know, we shouldn't be mere weary, but it's also possible you could get weary, but we're not to be weary. Don't let yourself be weary. This is the things that were good. Well, they were doing some good things. Did they have it all together, though? No. Because now he's talking to them about things where they're not right. Those are the good things that they're going to see a good judgment, good result from. A, you're going to pass the test. All those things. Now we come to verse 4, and he says, Nevertheless, I have. Now remember, the word somewhat isn't there. <laughs> it's not there. Here it is. Nevertheless, I against you. And that's the four words there in the beginning. There isn't any somewhat. The translator must have wanted to water it down a little bit. If I say I have somewhat against you, it's I'm kind of watering it down, aren't I? But if I say I have against you, there's no watering down on that one. <laughs> and that's the truth. I have, uh, I'm having against you, having present tense. Well, that's quite an indictment against them. I mean, you better straighten this area up or you're in trouble. I'm having against you because you have left your first love. Who's supposed to be our first love? The Lord. And how do we know that we are loving the Lord? Remember what it says? John 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. In other words, these guys weren't keeping the commandments anymore. They weren't keeping the word like they should have been. They'd left their first love. Verse 21. He that's having my commandments and is keeping them, both of these present tense, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I'll love him and will manifest myself to him. You know, the Bible says, I will love him that loves me. It's in Proverbs 8, verse 17. Notice, he responds in love to those that love him. But who's the one that loves him? The one who has his commandments and keeping them. That's why we went through all that series with the commandments and the sayings and all the things that are important that you must get a hold of and do in your life. Jesus answered, if a man love me, he will keep my words. These guys left their first love. They obviously weren't keeping the commandments and keeping his words any longer. Oh, they were making big mistakes. Notice what he says. My father will love him and we'll come into him and make our abode with him. 
Well, obviously, if God comes and you're going to be protected, you're going to be victorious, you're going to overcome if God makes his abode in you, because he doesn't come and, and then you get beat up by the devil. Why? Because you keep his commandments and you do the things that he says. He that loveth me not, and they lost, left their first love, is not keeping my sayings. In the measure you're keeping your, the sayings and the commandments is the measure that you truly do love him. And if you're not keeping his commandments and not keeping his sayings, there's, there's trouble. John 15, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Well, that means Jesus had to keep his Father's commandments. He did. Well, what do you think we have to do? Same thing. We keep his commandments. That's how we're going to abide in his love. And what happened to these guys? What's going to happen when the Antichrist comes on the scene, the lawless one, and he's talking about all these things against God, and he's telling you, do anything you want, and he, like, everybody wants to have pleasure and, un and unrighteousness and do all these things? <laughs> the deceivableness of unrighteousness comes to them? And these guys are all on the perishing road, destruction road. Why? How'd they get there? Because they receive not the love of the truth for their being saved. Well, that meant they didn't have the love of the Word any longer, because the Word's the truth. They weren't walking in the truth any longer. You must be a doer of God's Word, otherwise you don't love Him. What do you mean? How can you tell me I don't love Him? I, have, I love Him. That's my attitude. God doesn't look at it as an attitude. It's all shown by action and obedience. Whoso keepeth His Word, in him, verily, is the love of God perfected. That's how it's going to come to the place of perfected, perfection. Hereby know we that we are in him. And then he comes down to chapter 5, verse 3, and he says, This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. We see it again in 2 John, verse 6. He says, This is love, that we walk after his commandments that we may walk after his commandments. Otherwise, it's shown it's conditional if you may be continually walking after it, present tense. Oh, that shows whether you have love. This is the commandment you've heard from the beginning. We should walk in it. In fact, you and I are to be keeping ourselves in the love of God, which would be by keeping the commandments and the saying of the Lord, because that's a key for you to get to eternal life. Look what it says, if you understand what's being said. Keep yourselves. This is a command to you and me in the love of God. How do I keep myself in the love of God? I keep his commandments, I do his sayings, I do everything he says. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, which produces what? Unto eternal life. Well, that means if the guy's not keeping himself in the love of God, is he going to get eternal life? <laughs> He's got no, he's not, he's not going to be able to be looking for expecting, you know, uh, expecting the fulfillment of the promises is really what this is referring to in this context, which is eternal life. That's the big picture, isn't it? So, Revelation, let's go back to there, chapter 2. And we'll just cover a couple more things before we stop. He said he had something against them. They left the first love. So he says, remember, therefore, from whence you're fallen, from where you've fallen, and repent, and do the first works. You should be going back to do the word. Or else I will come unto thee quickly with quickness and speed, again, and will remove thy candlestick out of this place, except thou repent. That means the light goes out. That's judgment. So that tells you the guys who leave their first love, that don't keep his commandments, keep his sayings, they're not going to pass the test. They're going to get the judgment and the light's going to be gone out of their life. They're going to be in trouble. What are they going to do in the tribulation time? Because remember, the tribulation is going to come right after that. They're going to be sunk because they're not walking in line with the word. Remember, the ones that like the deceivables and the righteous, they're on the perishing road. 
while the guys who are walking in line with the Word, they're on the righteous the salvation road. But those guys who didn't accept the love of the truth for their being saved, they're not going to be saved now because they're not walking in the way of the Lord any longer. And this thou hast, and we'll cover this later about hating the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans, the Nicolaitans is so terrible. We'll cover this later, but I just want to bring this to your attention. The Nicolaitan belief was that grace and mercy was the basis of salvation, which is true, but that man can freely partake of sin because law wasn't binding. They think they weren't under law anymore, which is a lie. We are under the law of Christ. And that grace was reckon, re, of reckoning righteousness was automatically without works. No conditions. God automatically does. That's a lie, too, because grace has conditions. They taught the flesh and sin had no effect on the soul, which is a lie. It does have effect on your soul. And so you don't have to do God's Word to be saved. They believe it didn't matter how you live. They claim the spirit of a person saved by faith in, Christ, in Jesus Christ and that sin dwells in the flesh. And so you'll remain a sinner and you always sin because, you know, you're a sinner still. That's a lie too, as we pointed out. So they accepted whatever you do, it doesn't matter. Lasciviousness, sexual sin, lustful desires, believe they were still saved. Kind of do it everything you want. That kind of teaching sets you up for anything goes in the unrighteousness. You realize that this teaching is the basis for the false teachings that are prevalent today? One saved, always saved. It's a lie. I'm perfectly righteous when I'm born again. It doesn't matter what I do. It's a lie. I'll always sin because I'm still a sinner, everybody says. It's a lie. You're not a sinner. And you're not to sin anymore. You can conquer it all. I'm not under any law. It's a lie. You're under the law of Christ and under the commandments of Jesus Christ. And we're saved, saved, so it doesn't matter what we do. That's the other teaching that says all your sins are forgiven past, present, and future. It's okay. It's a lie. Those are five abominable teachings that are going forth in the body of Christ today. These guys are sunk if they don't come to repentance. This is the abomination of the Nicolaitan teaching, conquering them with false teachings. What an abomination. He, he said these guys were doing right. They hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And he says, I hate. He, God, God hates that. He hates that teaching. And then he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. we got to hear. Why would we need to hear? Because we need to get things right. And then he, in every one of these, he ends up talking about overcoming. To him that overcomes and carries off the victory will I give to eat of the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. Oh, that's the big picture. Hey, we want to be eaten of the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. But it's the guy who overcomes. The guy who conquers and carries off the victory. Not just once in a while. Present tense. Are you able to conquer and carry off the victory in every situation? Yeah. He says he'll give you the victory and always cause you to triumph in all things in Christ. As we hear and do the word. Don't ever succumb to defeat. Don't ever give place to anything that's contrary to what God will do for you in the word. He's correcting them. He's bringing them in line and saying, these are the good things you're doing. Hey, you've got to get this in order. And if you don't get this in order, your candlestick is going out the window. And you're going to be sunk in what's coming after that. That's the first one, Ephesus. And we've got more to talk about this. We'll talk a little bit more about some of those points as we go through this. We're going to be going through point by point and covering about 45, 46 different main things that are brought forth, either that we do or don't do, that need to get established in our life, so we'll pass the test and we'll come through the time of the judgment. So we will be right with Him. We will be protected. We will conquer. We will see all these tremendous th promises that God has for us come to pass, and that we can be those 
who can come through to the very end to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the revelation that is brought forth in the book of Revelation. I understand John was in spirit on the Lord's day, referring to the seventh day, seeing the activities that are happening when the Lord comes on the scene to rule and reign for a thousand years. I understand that I am to be a doer of the word and to pass the test. And as I walk in the ways of the Lord and do what he commands me to do, I will pass the test. I see the things that they were doing that was right. But I see also they had left their first love. I will make sure that I am doing what he says. He knows my works. I'm going to be judged according to my works. My labor. I will be a laborer, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I will be steadfast in the soul so that I see all the promises come to pass. I see the fruit come to pass. The enemy doesn't take the word out. I will come to perfection and I will see God accomplish everything in my life. And I will not tolerate and not put up with anything that's evil. Everything will be dealt with. I will not compromise. And I will test everything in line with the word of God to see if it's true. And I thank you that as I see what the word says, I will choose to do the word. And I will not faint. I will test everything according to the word. I will never faint or get weary. I will always pray. I will be steadfast, holding fast on the word, praying the word, speaking the word, doing the word, warring against the enemies and conquering them. And I see that I will be a doer and conquer and carry off the victory in every situation by the power of God as I hear and do his word. And I will eat of the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. I will pass the test. Thank you. I'll get established in doing the word and pass the test that you have laid out in the word of God. Thank you for all you're accomplishing because I'm a hearer and a doer of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. This is part one of many parts that we're going to be going through. And when you, we go through this, after seeing all this, if you come in line with everything, you'll be ready for whatever comes down the line. Father, we thank you for all you brought forth. We'll be hearers and doers of this word. Thank you. <clears throat> we will do everything you say. We will correct everything that needs to be corrected. We will overcome and conquer, and we will see you accomplish everything in our life. Thank you for we will be the righteous that are being saved that will come through victorious in these last days because we are hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.